start recording. Okay, so this is our final book club of the summer. Our theme this summer has been the summer of food and agriculture. Uh, we started out in June reading Braiding Sweetgrass. And then in July, we read The Seeds of Science. And we are concluding our, our book club with this book, The Botany of Desire, which I have heard many people mention, but I had never read. So this was good to read this because I think it came out, I want to say it was like 2002. So this is, um, you know, this is a book that I've heard people talk about on and off for a while. And I had just never really sat down to read it. And so we've got an opportunity to kind of talk about this book, particularly in the context of, of our theme, which I think will be interesting. Um, before we do that, I will go ahead and, as always, do some introductions. So my name is Laura Williams. I'm an assistant professor of biology at Providence College in Providence, Rhode Island. And in, in my little gallery right below me is Nicole. Um, Nicole, do you want to introduce yourself? Certainly. Hello. I'm Nicole Sukdio, and I'm a sessional instructor in the Department of Biology at the College of New Caledonia in Prince George, British Columbia. And I'm discovering in real time that this room probably has the right lighting to do remote lectures, so maybe that's what I stick with. And I'm really looking forward to discussing this book and this author's voracious love of adjectives. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good cliffhanger comment so that people will be like, what are we going to talk about? Um, and then underneath Nicole, we've got uh, Jess. Hi, I'm Jessica Lowry. Um, I, I work at uh, the University of British Columbia in the Okanagan, um, in British Columbia, Canada. Uh, and I mainly am a writing assistant at the library. And then Joel. I'm Joel Graff. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of biology at Montana Tech, Montana Technological University. We just changed our name this summer. Um, but it shortens up to Montana Tech, so really nothing has changed. Um, and we're located in Butte, Montana, site of one of the largest environmental waste sites uh, in the country, Superfund site. That's kind of our claim to fame is our pit full of toxic water. So we can talk about that later if you guys want talk about toxic water but anyway glad to be here been in this journal club for several years and it's uh took a little time off but it's good to be back you're really selling butte montana there <laughs> what what did it used to be because i know you've always introduced yourself as i think montana tech right what what did your name used to be uh it used to be montana tech of the university of montana um but awesome. they gave our university a well there's two flagship universities. And so all the smaller colleges in the, in the state were either under University of Montana or Montana State University. Okay. But our college has, uh, it's the en premier engineering school and well, all this stuff. So they gave us special status this last year. So we changed our name and added the word university to our title. It's convenient that you can still do, use Montana Tech, though. You don't have to change all that stuff. Um, that helps for all the sweatshirts and everything that people have. And then um, what is someone who is technically showing up as iPad, who is actually Joan. <laughs> do you want to introduce oh. yourself? Uh, I'm Joan Williams. I'm Laura's mother. I'm in Fishers, Indiana, which is a northern suburb of Indianapolis. And uh, I am a retired person with an undergraduate degree in education. And uh, I listened to the audio book, enjoyed it very much. I'm very successful with audio books. Yeah, I was glad there was a, an easily accessible audio book for this one for you, because I know that's your preference. Um, okay, so The Botany of Desire. Um, this was a very interesting book. I'm glad I read it. I, I felt like I felt like the chapters were very independent entities from each other. And, and I don't necessarily feel like they followed the same, I don't even know how to describe it. 
approach, style, narrative voice, maybe? I'm not even sure how to describe it. Did, did you? Has anyone here read The Omnivore's Dilemma by the same author? Uh, it was the exact same style. The, the, that book is about um, our food systems in four different meals was what he did. And so there was a, um, a McDonald's meal, uh, an organic meal, uh, a hunter and gatherer meal, and I don't know, one other one, a uh, fishing maybe. I don't, I don't remember what the third one was. Uh, but it was, I started this out and he's like, we're gonna go through four different sections. I'm like, this is the same formula he's gonna use a couple years later for Omnivore's Dilemma. Yeah, maybe that's, I'm, that's very interesting note because it, I just kind of wondered, is this just how he does things? Does he just kind of split this up into chunks? And I kind of wondered, did, did you guys, the, the only place that I detected that he was actually trying to draw a thread through all these as the framework of the book was, was really in the introduction where he kind of lays out this idea of these different types of desires and then kind of how humans and plants have co-evolved, which I want to come back to. But um, that was the only place that I really strongly picked up on kind of a, a continuing thread. Did, how did other people, how did that land with other folks? <laughs> Nicole. Um, I mean, as far as him addressing sort of anthropocentric wants and needs around all of the plants like he got there the cannabis chapter i think really threw me because i was not expecting that much um writing on the motivation to be intoxicated and the qualitative descriptors of of how that might show up like that one was just uh so I kind of sped read the book and don't know that much about it because I was falling behind. And I did find that a bit frustrating in that chapter because it just felt like, I don't know if he was trying to mirror the feud of intoxication by dropping topics in like that, but if that's what he was going for, that's how it felt to me. Um, I think he did admit that part of, part of the chapter was written when he was stoned. I think he did say that at one point. He was like, well, I wrote that while I was a little high, so maybe. Yeah, he might have. Um, <laughs> I seem to recall that because that was what got read between like 11 o'clock last night and one this morning. So admittedly my own sleep debt intoxication. But like, I think, I don't know. I'm kind of wondering like, did he have a mission to really show the push and pull of are the plants manipulating us or us them? And I didn't feel like that was a very tight thematic thread interwoven, other than the fact that he did capture why these plants were, you know, central to cyclical, um, well, not cyclical, but societal upheavals in some cases, or, you know, competing ulterior motives for law enforcement and control, or you know, aesthetic preferences and the intertwining with class structure and wealth. I mean, all of those things show the very human side of our fixation with plants. Mm -hmm. Well, you might be sleep deprived, but that made a lot of sense to me. So that's... <laughs> I... So just quick, Laura, I'll yeah. jump in. Um, another tie-in to another one of his books is uh, the marijuana chap or the marijuana section. Uh, his latest book is um, How to Change Your Mind. And I haven't read it yet, but it's basically uh, all about mushrooms, <laughs> magic mushrooms. So he, uh, he has some favorite topics like that. I, I think, so I'm curious about, before we kind of get into the chapters themselves, I read the introduction and I, and I have to admit as, as somebody who teaches symbiosis and perhaps I would not have reacted as strongly to this before I started teaching the class. But when, when I teach symbiosis, we are, we spend the first couple of class sessions talking about how, talking about definitions of symbiosis. Um, people in the field 
have specific definitions. They've tried to kind of define what is a symbiosis versus not. You know, is any interaction between two species a symbiosis? Symbiosis re researchers would say, no, no, no. You kind of need to meet these particular criteria. Um, and one of their criteria is, is coevolution, like measurable kind of detectable coevolution between two species. So you get like the fig and the fig wasp where the fig wasp can really only pollinate the fig and the fig needs the fig wasp and, and it's a very tight mutualism. Um, things get more fuzzy, but, but they're very picky about coevolution. And I think even evolutionary biology people would, would be picky about what you're defining as coevolution. And here he kind of like put it into the introduction. And, and I admit that I was kind of like, mm, I don't, I don't can, are we going to show that? Like, is that legit? Um, did, it, did, that, did that strike anybody else as kind of a, either an accurate or a, a, like a loose use of, of coevolution? So I, I had you, go ahead, Nicole, oh. I keep jumping in. Nicole, go ahead. Oh, well, okay. Um, I guess there's a couple things here. I, one thing that I noticed in this book right away, and I don't know if it was because of the edition I had, is uh, the lack of parenthetical documentation for anything that was cited. So it was just like, ideas seem to be very casually drawn in. And I think that's part of why I also, I think, struggled with how much is he setting up as far as um, the human and the plants on sort of a temporal, biological, ecological matrix where there's some kind of tangible shift in function form, you know, strategy for dispersal, whatever. And I mean, he does kind of get into the whole people spreading seeds around, but like not really qualified biogeography, biogeographically or any of those other things that I think you are hinting at, which I think is really the language You've captured perfectly what I think was missing for me reading this through the scientist eye. I also have a bone to pick with the plants as photosynthetic innovators because cyanobacteria don't get respect ever, it seems, except for life on a young planet. And I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> not that. So that's what I'm going to say to your piece on the coevolution. I do think that it was a very um, freestyled insertion and not well qualified throughout the body of the text. So I, I was going to just say that I teach a 200 level introduction to evolution class so non majors or mostly what who are in this class. We have a great textbook by Carl Zimmer that doesn't even like make um, the keywords bold. Uh, it's just meant to be read and enjoyed. Uh, but in one of the things that I do in that class, I have an extra assignment that I call an Amazon review. So I either have the students watch a video or read an essay or, or do some sort of a worksheet thing. And then they are to write an Amazon review. So they need to come up with a catchy title. They rate their, uh, their, uh, the assignment on a scale of one to five stars. And then they need to write an argumentative um, essay on why or why not uh, it's appropriate for a 200 level introduction evolution class. And um, one year when we were in uh, co-evolution chapter, uh, I picked out uh, an excerpt from this book uh, as, the, as the Amazon review. So just an excerpt was in like a, on, on a magazine or something like that. And it was about the birds and the bees and the flowers. And there was a fair amount of, you know, sexual innuendo and stuff like that going on. And the students, they usually give this, my assignments like fours or fives. There was a lot of ones or twos and they just thought that it was a stretch and it was just like a dirty old man just trying to <laughs> throw in a bunch of references to sex. So anyway, that was my, and I had, at the time, I guess I had never thought about, well, are these even really good examples? But when it, the, the examples that he gave in the book, maybe they're not very good, but there's, yeah, like, like you were pointing out with the fig and the fig wasp or, or whatever, there are plenty of good examples. And that's what, fortunately, that's what the textbook talked about. And I feel like for me, I think, I think I, I really, 
I wouldn't have minded the framing. I think the main thing that, that kind of reached out and like smacked me about the framing was simply the use of the word coevolution. I almost feel like if he had chosen a different way to describe this, like relationships between people and plants or reciprocity between people. I, I mean, I'm, I might have been a little less about it, but I just, I think I've been, especially from teaching symbiosis, because that's one of the criteria I have to enforce for them. Like I, I demand that they give me like, what is your evidence that you, you can actually show coevolution? So I think I've become like oversensitized <laughs> to the use of the word, um, which it was just interesting because I, because the, I, I don't think that I minded the framework of we're going to think about how people have interacted with plants and plants have interacted with people. I just thought in the introduction, oh boy, are we really going to do coevolution? And then he kind of dispensed with that for the rest of the book. Like he didn't, he didn't really come back to, it's my goal to show you coevolution. So I kind of, after that, I was like, oh, okay, this really isn't about, we're going to show that people have been tightly co-evolving with tulips all this time. We're just really talking about interactions and relationships. Uh, which made sense to me. So I think it was one of those, um, I don't know if that's just me being picky, but, um, but it is one of the things that since I teach that, I'm just, just like, oh, you can't say that. You can't just throw that out there. Um, so the framework of this book is basically, I'm going to pick four plants and we're going to talk about kind of the relationship between people and plants. So he starts out with the apple which um, I really liked this section about the apple. There was a lot of stuff. Maybe I should let Joan tell, tell the, the connection that the house that she's in actually right now, the connection that we have to apples. Mom, do you wanna? Yes, uh, I live on apple tree circle. So when we originally moved here, there were some apple trees in the backyard. This used to be an apple orchard. And when we were searching for a house, I was very picky about toxic areas was there any other toxic dump like you're talking about joel where you are toxic things and wires are there wires up there so this used to be an apple orchard so there's apple tree circle apple tree drive apple tree court and then what you don't know about having apples in your backyard is that when the apples fall down and you have to cut the grass well there's all these wasps and everything and our apples were never eating apples so first we'd have to go out and you'd have to bug spray so you kill all the stinging insects pick up the apples and then cut the grass so yes it's it, it makes it a more involved process when you have the apple tree so they have died i don't know what the um lifespan of an apple tree is but we don't have any more there were three when we bought this house so and i thought the apple chapter was very interesting too i thought you know all of you are more scientific than i am i thought in each of the chapters it was interesting to hear where the plant originated because i really hadn't thought about that before that apples aren't even native to the united states and i thought it was interesting that he, they said that uh, good apples don't grow from seeds, they have to be grafted, and that apples were usually uh, originally used to make an alcoholic beverage rather than this healthy apple we think of today. So I will let somebody else talk. Oh, that was good. I, I, thought, I thought that would be appropriate to talk about our apple background. Um, and, and I mean, and I'm from Indiana, so that's Johnny Appleseed territory. So who knows? Does that, is, was our apple orchard a Johnny Appleseed apple orchard? Hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I had not thought that much because I didn't really take it. Did I take any botany? I took plant and fungal diversity as an undergraduate. And then I didn't really take much else in terms of botany. And so I hadn't ever really thought about where a lot of these plants came from. I um, certainly had not thought about apples as originating from, I think it was Kazakhstan as their kind of cradle of apple diversity. And I also was really interested by the discussion of how the significance and the symbolism of apples has changed over time. Um, that really struck me. I don't know, is that, did, 
was that new to anybody else? Did other people kind of already have this knowledge of like, oh, it was really previously it was about cider and so forth. And so that might have been a revelation for a lot of people. <laughs> I didn't know that. I thought it was very interesting. And then I thought it was the women were against apples because you made it into the al al alcoholic beverage. So I, yeah, I thought all of that was very interesting. And I also thought in the apple section, it was interesting that now I can't remember, is it upstate New York where that um, man has all of those seeds that have come over from that one place? Is it in where the apples originated that all those different varieties still are? I thought that was very interesting too. And that he went there and visited and all the different shapes of apples. So yeah, I thought the apple section had a lot of interesting parts. I think it's amazing all the things that an apple can be. Like the apple plant, the, the apple, I think the way they described it is some things were more kind of like shrubs, some things were like big huge oak tree type thing. I mean just the, the variety in the plant itself and then also the variety in the fruit that is produced by these different plants, which I really had not thought about that. I just, you know, you get your standard kind of apples that you see when you go to the store or if you go to an orchard around, around, around now. Um, but I had not really considered the origin of apples and kind of the amount of genetic diversity and kind of phenotypic diversity in apples, which is pretty astonishing to think about. And there really was just like one, it, they made it, he makes it sound like there was just like one guy in Kazakhstan, like <laughs> guarding this, all these apples and then he's like well they're gonna mow this under for some development maybe you guys should do something about this which i don't know if it actually went down like that but what uh kind of, yeah go ahead. oh sorry i just kind of wanted to add that i think this book kind of um made apples more appealing i don't know i i'm not a fan that is the, the my least favorite fruit so it was kind of interesting reading this and going huh maybe that's just because there's only a couple of varieties I've actually tried and eh. or I think we also had a kind of similar um, uh, experience with apple trees as well because we have a we had this kind of stunted little um, crab apple tree in the backyard that was just not good for eating and and it would just kind of attract bears so I was kind of um, interested in in a little bit about, about this history and a little bit about um, to try I guess different varieties now that I know a little bit more about how the plant actually grows and, and, and more about what it is. Laura, since you want to talk about coevolution, I'll just mention in that Carl Zimmer textbook that I use, it's called The Tangled Bank. But anyway, they have an example about apple trees and he mentions that they're not native to the United States and there's another type of fruit tree uh, and I can't think of what it is, but um, also not native to the United States. But when they started bringing those into the Northeast and putting them in their yards uh, and stuff, the, the Europeans, uh, there were uh, different types of these, I don't wanna say fruit flies because that, that's Drosophila melanogaster, but flies that like eating fruit and laying their eggs in fruit. Um, they kind of ignored the fruit for a while, but now they are using the fruit to lay their eggs and as a food source. And what's interesting is that the, the uh, fruits come out at different times, the apples versus the other type of fruit that I'm blanking on. And there's getting to be certain flies that only go to the apple trees and the certain flies that only go to the other tree and they only come out in their, their uh, yearly or annual pattern of, of doing things matches with the fruit tree. So it's a, an example of a beginning of a coevolution link between those. And is it, is it the same? Is it also an example of, of um, speciation? Is it the same ancestral fly species that's starting? Yeah. To kind of... In fact, it, it, I can't remember if it was in the coevolution chapter or in the speciation chapter, but oh, it kind cool. of, you know, kind of fits in both topics a little bit. Oh, that's but, neat. Uh, oh, and most nights I have a one, one beer before bed. Um, usually it's a, a brown ale, but after that apple chapter, I've been kind of hooked on hard ciders. 
<laughs> so I, my father-in-law was in town and I gave him a hard cider last night and he took one sip and he tried to pawn it off on my mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, that's not for me. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, it's funny because it, the, the chapter makes it sound like cider was uh, preferred by, by people in a certain period in the United States over beer. Uh, which is not something that I think I would have, that would have occurred to me. Uh, but if you're, if you're being, if you're being asked as part of a homestead act to plant an orchard, then might as well make cider with it. Cause what else are you going to do? So that's, there was a, there was a lot in that chapter that was all kinds of things related to the apple that I really didn't just did not know anything about. Um, trying to think it, it, any other apple related nicole there's an actual there's an apple twitter account okay so on that it's actually an account that is named officially old fruit pictures and it's a bot that just tweets mostly apples these are um historical paintings of fruit from the usda's collection i've noticed they've been repping mangoes a lot more aggressively which is also very cool and the odd cherry and um a bunch of other stuff but like initially when i started following them it was like apples all the time and still i mean it's cool because michael pollan makes a point that i think also relates a lot to like us living in sort of this anthropocene industrial thing where our knowledge of the breadth of apple biodiversity is what do we see in the grocery store and like he does make that point around how the apples with the highest sugar contents ended up being the ones that were commodified to kind of compete with the market for sugar containing foods when that became an importable raw material that was easy to bring into the US and, and make candy from. So what we understand as the breath of apples is actually, you know, a cognitive awareness that's shaped by the food supply chain that we've kind of been born into, not you know, understanding that there are blue mushy apples that don't have a very high sucrose glucose content at all compared to the things that we see in the grocery store all the time. So I kind of like old fruit pictures just because it's an automated reminder that like not everything is the Granny Smith and the Red Delicious. There's all these other ones that actually used to be uh, either specimens for USDA or possibly commonly cultivated that aren't really a thing. Which is also why the new Geneva apple orchard part, Joan, I agree with you, that was a very cool part of the book, just to know that there's kind of like the enacted apple Wikipedia growing out of the ground there, kind of, in a way. I meant Yes, I and, there, and there's somebody in the United States that's helped saving those. That, that I like that concept too. Oh, I meant to actually, diversity. yeah, I meant to actually go look and see if it is still active because, because this book was, was written a while ago now. Um, and I didn't get a chance to, but I might, I might try to do that today to see if that, if that Apple bank, app, I like Apple Wikipedia, I like that, um, is still going. Yeah. No, Nicole, thank you for sharing that. I was just looking at, I just pulled up the Twitter account. I was just looking at some of their, it looks like they've posted some Apple pictures or Apple paintings. Uh, recently. I like the fact that on this account they've got, um, it's the app, I mean this must be traditionally how you do these these paint these paintings, but they've got the apple on the outside but then like what it looks like when you've cut through it so you can kind of see where the seeds are. Um, so that's neat too, which is not always the same. So yeah, that's cool. So lots about apples that I did not know anything about. Um, and, and I think for me, I think the last thing that I was going to mention, um, unless people have other things they want to talk about with the apples, which is, I thought it was really interesting to think about the symbolism of an apple changing in, in even just American culture to the point that if you, I mean, he raises this point in the book that if you go back into, I want to say like 19th century writing, so 1800s, people who are kind of mentioning apples mean something very particular. And because apples were, were not eaten so much as they were made into cider, they kind of have in that context an association with alcohol. And that once you got the, 
I think, as I remember, it was a response to prohibition where the, app, the, the, the Apple advocacy industry um, said, you know, started with the whole, well, we should start eating our apples and an apple a day and all this kind of stuff and turned it into this very wholesome idea of, you know, eating apples is good for you. So when we see references to apples now, we kind of think, oh, well, that's like as a fruit that you would typically eat and not as a fruit that you would use to turn into alcohol, which is a very different way of thinking about what an apple symbolizes if you're talking about it in, in poetry or in prose or using it in a book as a, as a, as a symbol or as a marker of something. And so I, I thought that was interesting because I thought, oh, I'm gonna have to remember that because if I run across stuff from older writing, if they're talking about apples, they might be meaning something very different from all, and it's almost like an automatic response. I think, I'm, I think that's, we're so acculturated to, by that kind of, for better or worse, marketing of apples as being wholesome that I don't even know that I would recognize unless I really thought about it. Like the symbolism of what I assume it means when you're mentioning apples. So that kind of threw me for a little loop. So I thought that was very interesting. Other thoughts about apples? All right. Well, um, I want yeah. I would want to say if we're transitioning now to Tulip, where Nicole was saying about the paintings of the apples that you're looking, that I remember in the tulip section, he said that there are some tulips that don't even exist anymore, and you only know them based on the paintings that you can see. So I thought that was interesting. I was going to mention that too, so I'm glad you got there before me. Yeah, that that's. I mean, tulip we diversity. We must think alike. <laughs> How could that be? Um, yeah, the, I mean, the idea that there's, the, the, there was a lot in the tulip chapter too. Um, I, I knew, I mean, I, I knew of the, Holland's reputation for, for tulips. Um, I didn't know that it, it became like a weird pseudo internet bubble. <laughs> The tulip market, I didn't realize it had gotten that crazy. Um, what did you guys think about his attempts to explain why Dutch people went head over heels for tulips? There was like an interesting argument that it was like, well, everything's like flat and swampy. And they're all like Calvinist and gray. So tulips. And I thought, hmm, there's got to be more to it than that. Right, and rich. He introduced that too, that they had money. True. And so they were almost punishing themselves, investing in that and then losing. So they, he also mentioned that part, which I don't know historically if that's true or not, but was interesting. I like that there's a, uh, I liked the discussion of there's a, there's a black tulip or it's not actually a black tulip. It's as close as they've gotten. I guess, uh, called Queen of Night. So it's, I'm, I'm, I envisioned it, and I should have gone and looked it up, but I didn't have a chance to. I envisioned it as like a, like a deeply purple kind of, kind of tulip, not quite black, but really, really close. Um, and I think that's, I think his discussion of what on earth would make you want to do this was really interesting. It's just like, well, I mean, why not have a black tulip if you can? Um, it's kind of contrary to what you think of when you think of tulips, I think, because you think of tulips as being these like vibrantly colorful, cheerful, kind of fill the landscape and you go, oh, look at all the tulips. Uh, so it, it's hard to imagine like an ocean of black tulips. Is Oh, Nicole, is that the, uh, is that a picture of a- Yeah, I think so. And I mean, I, so I think this, this chapter disengaged me because there was just so much restating of whatever he wanted to say about the geometric contours of the tulip plant intermixed with the history that tired brain was not processing that well but I mean I'm kind of wondering because for those of you who've read this more thoroughly did he get into sort of the whole idea of if we can manipulate color, then this idea of rarity as value might play into the whole why do we want to make black flowers? Because it's sort of been a thing with roses. They want, there's varieties that are blue and black, and you don't really get a true blue, nor do you get a true black, but people try. 
And I mean, I remember when I lived in Southern Ontario, there was this now defunct like garden supply company called White Rose. And it always had like this catalog that came out every year. And like, I was not a gardener, but this catalog was encyclopedically set up with all like the whole rose chapter had like just blocks and blocks and blocks of roses by variety and like who they were named after. And they kind of had the same deal for tulips when you showed up at White Rose in the spring, just rows and rows and rows and rows of boxes with these little placards with like all the colors and were they named after a celebrity or some president's wife or whatever. And I, I don't know, I feel like, I feel like these were sort of like the hockey cards of the 1600s and the 1700s in a way, like there's that sort of collector mentality, like maybe it's not that it was swampy, maybe it was just that there was enough varietal that for people, the collect the whole set kind of deal or what can we make might have, might have been actually like a very human want, preference, recreational source of joy that people kind of went for with with I mean, it's not really like this isn't really about plant ecology and and I mean it is sort of about form and less about function although function you could call aesthetic perception function I guess but like this is just some weird crap that humans do because we like pretty and intriguing things sometimes I guess I I liked your I like your your comparison with with like collecting like baseball cards or something like that. And I was, I was, because I was going to say something very similar, which is like, I think that this appeals to the, 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 the breed of gardener who, who's just like order, like order is really, you know, you can, those catalogs, because he describes them at one point as like these extensive gardening catalogs. And I thought that sounds exhausting. It sounds exhausting, but I can imagine that there are people who spend like all winter like going or I don't know what the cycle is for gardeners but like going through these catalogs like and now I'm gonna get that one and we're gonna try to cross it with this thing and then we're gonna do, and I'm, I mean I can imagine there are gardeners with like spreadsheets of like and then we got these and we're gonna have five of these and we're gonna do this and there's the the quadrat that we're gonna plant them in <laughs> and I kind of wonder if this is having all these varieties or trying to produce varieties appeals to those folks it it's it's so, I, I know in, in uh, last book club, we kind of called back to braiding sweetgrass, but I'm gonna do that again, because it's, it's such a contrast to me, to the way she talked about interacting with nature, where you kind of, you know, and he says this too, like a garden is, is an attempt to some degree, and it, it's on a spectrum depending on who you are, what type of gardener you are. It is, a, to some extent, an attempt by human beings to create some kind of order in the plant world. Some, some, some realm in which we have kind of subdued a little bit of the, the wildness of what would have been there otherwise and tried to put things there that we want. Um, and then it, it's, it's just interesting. It's interesting to kind of think about the different ways that, that people think about that. I would have been very curious to know what, what um, what she would have, what the author whose name's unfortunately escaping me at this moment because there's too much in my brain, but who the author of um, braiding, what, what the author of braiding sweetgrass would have thought about tulips, like what her chapter or her essay on tulips would have been. Um, which is not to say that one is right or not, but just the contrasting kind of approaches to thinking about what is a tulip and what does it mean? And what does it mean when we try to grow it? Um, is really interesting. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in. Um... It's Robin Wall Kimmerer, is who you're trying to think of. But um, besides Omnivore's Dilemma, the other book that I've read by Michael Pollan was called Second Nature. And it was about gardening and controlling nature and all that stuff. So if you if you like that topic, he's, you can have a whole book on it. <laughs> but, does, uh, he, does he kind of, because I didn't, I got a little bit of a sense of, of his approach to gardening through this book, but I don't think he attempted to make that the focus. Does he talk more in that book about what his view of gardening, what his gardening philosophy is? Well, I was just going to say, he tends to get philosophical about everything, um, whether it was the what foods we eat or uh, taking care of your yard or whatever. Um, and sometimes it gets over the top. Um, the author of the or the narrator of the audiobook is Scott Brick, 
And this book seemed pretty um, tame, but there are some Scott Brick narrated books where he just over exaggerates his voice on just everything and it just get and so when I'm when I saw that the narrator was Scott Brick I'm like you know Michael Pollan's a little bit on the pompous side and then here's this narrator that that really gets into things this is going to be terrible but uh I did I did listen to the audiobook and it and it actually he he was tame this book compared compared to other books but yeah he he overthinks everything I someone was talking about adjectives so I don't know maybe that'd be a good segue to <laughs> yeah I think that was Nicole Nicole is that a good is that a good lead-in for you to talk about adjectives uh yeah I mean I don't know how I felt about his whole thing about with bees it just seems like the geometric contours of a rose were less inhibitive to finding the reproductive structures, whereas the tulip seemed deliberately designed to conceal them. And I'm like, no, it's flappy. Like, this isn't a problem. <laughs> There's no combination lock. There's no bolt. It's all good. Like, I mean, for a person who looks at the world the way Michael Pollan does, I guess it's his license to uh, expound on things and it's just like i mean i do worry if some of that is objectification for the sake of objectification but since you're actually writing about a book where people are shamelessly well not even shamelessly but with sharp utilitarian motivations manipulating nature as opposed to assuming a sense of place which is totally the spirit of robin wall kimmerer's book or like what experiences need to allow you to have a better sense of your fit within an ecological continuum and in a world where the world view is not about your locus of control it kind of makes sense that he writes in the tenor that he does um and i kind of posted in our chat the virus broken tulip thing because i didn't i didn't know originally that that feathery tulips kind of came from that sort of manipulation and it's cool that he addresses that in the chapter that like they were actually kind of after tulips of those aesthetics until they realized that the trajectory of a virus infected tulip is that the bulbs are just of lower quality through generations so well uh yeah. i've seen um like textbooks talk about how viruses can cause the tulips to have that striped look to them. The, those, those, is it, to my memory, it didn't mention that it actually caused great harm to the, the plant and that you end up not being able to propagate those for very long. So, I mean, it makes sense, but I, I had always thought, oh, it's just a harmless virus that just makes it look pretty. And so like now the virus is spreading because people want to, share the the cracked tulips but but uh yeah apparently it harms them and they don't last long yeah and, and i was thinking about that that that's a good uh, you know if you're going to talk about interactions and trying to characterize interactions which we do in my symbiosis class it would be interesting to say okay well in the in the in the in the theme of what he's talking about kind of makes an argument of, which, which is definitely fair, of the artificial selection of human beings on tulips for their appearance and nothing else. Um, so not, not really for, do they, do they propagate really well? Do they, there isn't a fruit that they produce, it's just how do they look, do they look good? And so this idea that you've got an infection with a virus that makes the tulip look a certain way that could be appealing to humans is interesting because if it is a harmless virus, then you could argue that that's beneficial because those flowers might be more cultivated by human beings because they want the feathery pattern. If it is harmful, then you'd argue that the virus is a parasite because it's harming the, the tulip's ability to, to reproduce, but it's propagating itself because it is directly kind of being selected for by humans. And so I thought, I tried, I didn't spend a lot of time trying to spin that out, but I thought maybe I'll come back to that when I teach, because I'm scheduled to teach symbiosis in the fall, in the spring. So we might come back to that as a way of talking about, you know, how do you define the outcome of an interaction 
what kind of factors do you need to, to consider and what kind of evidence do you need to have? And just thinking about the virus and the tulips wouldn't be enough because we do have this instance of the fact that human beings are doing a lot of artificial selection on tulips. And so that's impacting tulip fitness in one way or another. Um, and I don't think I've done that very often in symbiosis. I've usually kind of kept people out of it when we talk about interactions among species. And so this might be a good way of kind of talking about artificial selection, talking about how humans can impact that. So I thought that was interesting. So I'll probably come back to that for spring. All right, so tulips. Anything, anybody want to mention else about tulips? Um, sure, I think I had a couple of criticisms of the chapter actually. Yes, um, I found it really interesting, um, the, the ideas and kind of, I had to look up all the pictures just to see what, it, what, what, it, what they would look like for sure. Um, Cause I couldn't quite picture it, but my, my couple of criticisms and these could be due to just the time in which this is written, but um, he continuously genders the tulips and I just don't understand why. And that was a huge thing that just kind of alienated me a little bit when I was reading through this. And he's constantly talking about how this has like more, you know, uh, female specific attributes, the way that he's labeling them. And, um, and at one point he actually uses the term bisexual. Uh, so that's page 98, I think. Anyway, that's one of my criticisms. And I think the other one would be, and these are probably both just uh, when it was written. Um, the other one would be kind of takes a more like Eurocentric view of the whole thing. I, I would be interested if, um, if there are similar ideas elsewhere. I believe he did bring up ancient Egypt at one point um, briefly. Uh, and then he kind of summed up all African cultures together and said that they weren't really interested in flowers. And so it's probably like 2002, but I, I just wasn't sure if anyone else had any thoughts on this. Jess, I'm glad you brought that stuff up actually, because that tulip chapter, I think I read like several lines of it to a friend of mine on the phone somewhere between 10.30 and 11.30 last night. We were both just vaguely nauseated by the gendering of the tulip. Like, I mean, even for the stem, I mean, that's just to keep it up and out of the ground and do a bit of photosynthesis. Like, really, man? Like, no. <laughs> it's just kind of an interesting over indulgence in sort of, I guess, gendered aesthetics that are assigned to these. And I mean, as far as the visual commodification of the tulip, which he had already kind of expounded on, I, I agree that that some of that reach into um, constructs of human identity that probably were irresponsibly placed on the topic of this chapter, I'm with you on that. It's It's not great. And I also did kind of side eye the broad brush on the African perception of flowering plants because again man does not have a whole lot of footnoting going on in here and like what breath I mean there's a lot of writing I mean take for example Dorothy Roberts fatal invention about that conflation of the African continent with understanding all of the cultural diversity of African nations and like if there's that going on here we can't really see it because we don't know what he's directly citing in real time per se so yeah I'm totally with you on those criticisms. You know one of the things I, I yeah those are thank you for making those notes because those definitely struck me when I was reading this chapter too. Um, one of the things that I thought was interesting is that um, Robin Wall Kimmerer, and thank you, Joel, for reminding me of her name, um, in Braiding Sweetgrass, she, she definitely at times kind of evoked some sensual things about kind of nature and plants and so forth. Um, but I think there's, there's a degree here to which it's, like, it's, it's kind of, it's, I think, which is what Jessica was saying, it's, it's essentialism where you're like, this is what being a woman is, and this is what being a man is. And so now we're gonna take these flowers and we're gonna like pop them into these boxes based on kind of what we think that is. Um, and that's, 
that's problematic. So I think you could talk, you could, I don't think there's anything wrong with being poetic about plants. Um, but I think being an essentialist about plants is probably where you start to fall down. And he definitely, definitely did some essential. I, I found the, the page. I had just flipped to it actually when you were saying like at one point he says they're bisexual and I'm like, I'm just like looking at that word right now. And that's, you're right, it's page 98 in, in my copy. And he's got down there later on the page, just you can walk through any garden and choose up sides, boy, girl, boy, girl, girl, girl. I'm like you can. <laughs> so yeah, that's, I wonder if he would, um, I wonder if he would still write something like that these days, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm teaching a class right now. It's called Discover Biology. It's our biology 101, 102 for non-majors. And, uh, uh, it's the first time I've taught it. I'm kind of covering for someone that's on sabbatical. And I think it's always been females that teach this class. So uh, when I went to, to make my syllabus, whenever I get to course description, I always go to the course description that is described on the Montana Tech page. I highlight it, copy it, paste it into my thing so that there's no discrepancy between what I say the course is and versus what the catalog says. And this year, it, it, it was talking, I, I was reading through it and I was like cringing because it said like, um, it was about some of the basics of learning some of the basics of biology. And then there was gonna be an emphasis on how mankind is part of nature and not above nature or something like that. But it, but it used mankind and I struck that word out and put humankind in. Uh, Cause I was just like, yeah. They, Things are changing. You, you got to be careful. Um, but uh, one thing I one that brings me up another idea though is that you were talking about artificial selection, mm -hmm. and so th so I just I had this idea pop into my head. So it's not really well thought out. But if if selection is based on what humans like or dislike, and we call it artificial selection, but then what if we're trying to say that humans are part of nature and what we do really affects nature and all that are we then then is saying artificial selection is it really artificial if we are part of nature uh so that's far too much philosophy for me but uh i, I wonder if at some point there might be um a backlash against the idea of artificial uh selection just because we're in nature and we're doing things biologically because of how we're programmed. Um, so anyway, that's my random thoughts there. Yeah, that's, that's true. I think that's a good point is how we, you know, what do, what do we define as artificial selection and why is it artificial? Um, setting ourselves apart, even in the way we frame that kind of domestication of things and artificial selection and so forth. Um, other thoughts about tulips? Okay, so I'm keeping an eye on the time. I want to be careful of people's time. Um, this, the, there was a chapter about marijuana and there was a chapter about the potato. And uh, I want to kind of open it to see if anybody had anything where they're like, I really want to make this comment about these two chapters. I, I will say that I felt like I think these last two chapters felt a little bit like um, I'm trying, I'm trying to, it, it, yeah. I don't have any better way of saying this than it's just kind of like a stream of conscious, like an actual stream of consciousness writing that he just was like, I'm going to write about marijuana and then just kind of, and then ended. <laughs> and then like potatoes and then ended. <laughs> and I remember thinking like, I don't, okay, okay. I mean, I learned some stuff. Not sure that I know what the arc was in these two chapters, but I learned some stuff. Um, thoughts on? Well, I wanted to say yeah. something about the potato and Irish history because my mother's parents are both from Ireland and my grandmother hated the Irish. And when the Beatles came, she did not want me to buy a ticket to go see the Beatles because they were English. She hated so, the English. Your grandmother. She, she hated the English. She was Irish. She was probably born between 1885 and 1900. So wasn't the potato famine 1856 in the book around then I'm trying to think. 
So it would not, you know, in her upbringing, wouldn't have been that far. So she did immigrate to the United States, came over across the ocean twice. So I just think all that information about how the Irish were kept down and they, the English were over them and took all the good land. And then the thing about the potato coming from, from the, here, that kind of came from the Americas because they said the Incas, which was very interesting. And it came over on a Spanish ship and before the peasants didn't have anything to feed themselves. And then the uh, inferences about a potato being underground and in the shade and evil because it doesn't grow up like wheat in the sun. I was like, oh my gosh, is this fact or is this the stream of consciousness you're talking about? But the Irish history part really struck me that, you know, and lots of different peoples have been starved across the uh, world. But that's very unfortunate when another a class of people keeps another class of people down like that and then they uh, lose their life. So I thought that part and the potato was good for them until they got the uh, potato disease. I didn't appreciate how nutritionally complete potatoes are, apparently. I gotta read, eat more french fries, apparently. That's just, I didn't know that, that's great. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, I did not know the origin of the potato. So that was really fascinating that, uh, and the diverse, and again, kind of coming full circle with the apple, just the diversity of potatoes. How many different kinds of potatoes there are and how, you know, I think the same thing's true with bananas. I think I remember reading like a Smithsonian article like a, a long time ago about all the all the varieties of banana and we just get one in the store. And and for people who know bananas and have a lot of banana exposure to different varieties of bananas, when they come to the United States, they're just like, ugh, this is like the worst one you could have picked. What's wrong with you? <laughs> like, I don't know, that's just what we have. Um, so I didn't I didn't get to the potato chapter, but I'm wondering, are they did, was there any mention of efforts now to go to the uh, mountains in South America and try to find more diversity of potatoes there and and spread that diversity instead of just sticking with russet potatoes that Luther Burbank was it Luther no something Burbank um, came up with uh, because it 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 reminds me of how they went to Kazakhstan and were trying to get some of the genetics from from apples some of that genetic diversity brought back into circulation but they're doing the same thing with potatoes did did they talk about that in the book not not that would have been interesting to feature uh what he did talk about which is interesting because we read seeds of science he talked about monsanto's um, bt toxin producing new leaf potato and so his approach to talking about you know, the vulnerability of a monoculture, what do you do about it? His approach was to talk about genetic engineering as a way of dealing with the Colorado potato beetle. Um, but I would have been very interested to, to see that contrasted with uh, a bigger emphasis on diversity in your, in your potato varieties. And he does mention uh, one organic farmer in, in Idaho who that's his approach is to basically plant different varieties of potato. And I think at some point he asks, are, do you ever, do you ever plant these russet Burbanks? And the guy's like, no, because the potato beetle eats them. So why would I do that? <laughs> Which is a completely like 180 from like, you know, other places in Idaho that he talks about where it's just, I mean, and he describes what some of these farmers have to do in order to cultivate this specific type of potato that McDonald's wants for French fries. And I don't think I'd ever read the, ex and maybe some of that has changed, but the extent to which in, in the early 2000s, they were just, it was a tsunami of chemicals that you have to add to these fields in these different s sequences. And I thought, good grief, like that, of course, that's going to, that's bad for the people that work there. That's bad for yeah. the soil. That's it made me wonder because every once in a while I like a baked potato and I was like, I don't know if I want to eat a baked potato or not. 
oh my gosh, because he talked about the ground being all gray and everything and not even brown anymore. It was like, oh my gosh. Then I wonder, are sweet potatoes grown like that? I'll have to Google that. And, and I don't, and I don't actually, I don't know the state of, um, of potato farming. Uh, you know, farming in general is it's so, it's, and I don't want to go on forever about this, but farming in general in, in the United States, there's, there's the perception of what farming is. There's the, the political use of farming as a, as a, as a symbol for something. And then there's the reality of farming, um, which are not at all, I think, aligned with each other. Um, so I'm, I'm in Western Montana, so I'm pretty close to Idaho. I don't know as much about Idaho as I should. I, I rarely go there, but um, I have like gone through it to get to like Boy Scout camps and stuff. And what really struck me was that there's so much um, plowing going on. Uh, there's a lot of other agriculture is, is switching over to no-till. It's better for the soil. You don't lose as much topsoil, all these sorts of things. But they were just all out plowing and it just looked like uh it looked like uh, it was it looked terrible to my eyes um after knowing about uh no-till but maybe you have to do that since they're potatoes but the um the other thing was that these fields that they were planting the potatoes in had pretty steep grades to them and all i could think about was the amount of erosion that's probably going on with with that that was my, th I, I didn't notice the ground being a different color, but uh, I just thought about all the, the topsoil loss. Yeah, yeah, boy. So um, I don't want to keep people longer, longer than, uh, than this little bit after three. Anybody have any kind of closing thoughts about, about this book? There's a, the last two chapters we didn't really talk about as much in depth. Anything anybody wants to, to venture? I'll go. I mean, I actually kind of feel like the potato chapter might be the one for you, Laura, in terms of teachables that connect to parts of seeds of science that you might want to use because he does get into the gene gun usage. And also, I think there's a little bit of food for thought in terms of monoculturing versus the organic intercropping, you know, cover cropping idea, as well as the whole Monsanto thing about planting refuge crops of non- BT resistant potatoes so that if there is sort of an insect with resistance, you've actually potentially got a whole bunch of insects for it to mate with to kind of not propagate the resistance and that whole idea of like, but how much refuge is enough? And like now we're trying to create this ecological diversity in a monoculture scheme for this BT potato. So again, it comes back to these ideas that a lot of what we're doing in Western food production and sort of Western planting things as settlement and colonialization are not really connected to genuinely understanding ecological connectivity. It's trying to impose them and hope we get it right to mitigate risks in a capitalist system. So there's that whole thing. Uh, also kind of interesting to think about the counterpoint of him describing uh, the rhetoric shift in England around the potato and the sort of class stigmatization of, of the Irish and also the way that shifted to get the potato as a food security resource in England. Interesting that he expands on it in that chapter, but in the Apple chapter we have like, I think it's 70 characters in parentheses about how the indigenous peoples of the states were aware of the colonial expansion and land disruption by settlers, but not much more considering the sort of largely settler driven expansion of Apple establishment across the contiguous US. So I'm kind of curious about why there's an imbalance in terms of talking about those aspects of marginalization in relation to crop establishment and, and rhetoric around crops between those two chapters. Yeah, that's true. That's interesting. I'll have to chew on that, but that's an interesting, yeah, that's an interesting thought. Other, other closing thoughts from folks? Um, I'll, I'll just say, I, 
I've read several of these books. Um, I think the Omnivore's Dilemma, the first two sections, the organic versus the McDonald's meal, uh, that was kind of the first time I ever even bothered giving organic like any thought because I, I came from Eastern Montana, very conservative, very, uh, we, you know, stuck in our conventional farming and ranching kind of ideas. And it was one of the most important books I've, I've read because since then I've read nothing but um, learning about uh, making, working with eco ecological systems and stuff for farming and uh, permaculture and all that. Uh, but if anyone is is interested in that, in addition to that omnivore's dilemma, another book that I read that was really good was called The Wizard and the Prophet. And it's by, um, la last name is Mann. Um, and he wrote 1491 and 1493, so before and after Columbus. So there, those books are about um, uh, Native Americans and stuff like that. But um, the book, that The Wizard and the Prophet, it compares the life of um, the Green Revolution guy, Borlaug, and uh, the one of the founders of um, organic farming, or one of the one of the people that was like anti pesticide and insecticide, all that. Um, and so, anyway, the wizard and the prophet is kind of like: Are we going to fix our problems with technology? Or are we going to fix our problems with with uh, actually learning from nature and going that route? So if, if anyone's interested, I, I recommend it. Thank you. Yeah, those are good recommendations. Uh, Jessica or Joan, do you want to add anything to close out? Sure. I, I think that um, this just kind of fit well with um, we were talking about braiding sweetgrass and we, and, we, and we talked about seeds of science and this one kind of um, fit well in there. I gave a different perspective. I think I, I really appreciated the, the breeding sweetgrass um, perspective for providing some more, um, more information, I guess, um, more perspectives. I feel like this book maybe could have gone into um, some more bigger issues. Um, you know, when we talked about like the tulips and maybe talking more about capitalism there and kind of getting into um, more about like Nicole said, the um, settler um, planting of apples. Um, so I think there was some opportunities missed. I think I learned a lot in this book though, and I think it was placed well between those others. Thanks. Yeah. Um, for my part, I, I was kind of amazed because I, I knew nothing about these three books that we read apart from their titles, their authors, and kind of a little bit about what they were about. And the order that I put them in was completely random. I cannot take credit for that at all. But I, for me, I think it really works. Like, I'm so glad we started with braiding sweetgrass because that helped um, set a foundation for kind of thinking about people and agriculture and food. And then kind of the seeds of science was, you know, a different way of approaching food and how we make food and how we produce food. Um, and in, in that way, like you're producing it as a good rather than kind of gathering it as something provided as a gift, which is the braiding sweetgrass mentality. And then this book was interesting to kind of follow up on both of those because it, it kind of joined a few of those things together in ways that um, I didn't really expect. So um, I'm actually very pleased, at least for my reading experience, I thought it was a good, a good one, two, three. Um, so I think it might, I think Joel, you might have suggested this, this one, Botany of Desire. So thank you if you did. Um, I think that was true. I was glad to read it because I hear so much about this book. Um, so I'm glad that I have now read it. Um, and so with that, I know we ran over a little bit, so I apologize for that. But um, I just want to thank everybody for another really excellent summer book club. Uh, it feels, it feels weird to be at September already, but here we are. Um, and this is our sixth book club. And so it's really, it's really nice to kind of get to uh, continue to do this with folks over time. Um, so we will, we'll do one again next summer, as long as we're all still standing, we'll, we'll do another one. Um, um, yeah. Nicole asked about that book and I just put a link to the wizard. It's Charles C. Mann, um, author of 1491. Oh, perfect. 1491's one I'm about halfway through. Okay. And I got kind of stuck, but that's, if you're interested in uh, indigenous Native American cultures prior to 
Columbus. That's an excellent one too. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah. I've been copying the links out of the chat as we've been going. So I'll give you, I'll give folks a chance to do that. Um, so thanks everybody. I really do appreciate you guys taking the time to do this. It is, it is a really wonderful thing about summer. It's nice to read these books and then get a chance to talk about them with people. Um, We'll do it again next next summer. So if you know folks, and, and Joel had mentioned somebody, um, if you know folks who you think might be interested, please please feel free to share this information with them. The website stays up, and um, and you know next spring, which will be here before we know it, I'll start asking for theme suggestions or book suggestions. Um, so thanks very much, everybody. I really appreciate it, and hope everybody thanks, has Laura. a good fall. I'm glad you put this together. <laughs> <laughs>